D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. In our day, the self-anointed elites sneer at Christianity, but Jesus Christ has been the object of faith for some of the greatest minds in history. Let's take the rules of evidence that everybody agrees on and let's apply them to the Gospels. And when they are applied to the Gospels, then we know that they are true. Discover how one of the greatest legal minds in human history determined that the evidence conclusively proves the facts of Jesus Christ on today's Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. Our current age tends to think of the Christian faith as something purely internal and subjective. If Christ means something to you, then for you he's real, and that's all that matters. But the Bible absolutely refutes that claim. It tells us repeatedly that if the things it says about Jesus are not true in real history, then Jesus need not matter to us at all. You might be surprised to discover that throughout history, many skeptics have been turned into powerful witnesses for Christ after examining the historical evidence. A bit later in the program, we will share some compelling resources with you that make the case for that evidence in a dramatic way. And as we begin, many today try to portray the Christian faith as something for credulous, unquestioning, and uneducated people. But a Harvard Law professor who was one of the greatest scholars in history on the rules of evidence disagrees. Here's our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb with more. Here, I'm going to talk about why the Gospels are fiction. Now, I use in formal parlance, we say myth. Uh, <clears throat> it really just means fiction. Not true. Uh, it's made up stuff. It's a common misconception to believe that Christianity is not based in actual history. But is that view based on actual history? Many assume that Christianity is a historical myth, much like Apollos or some of the Greek myths, but Christianity is based on historical events that can be verified both archaeologically and literarily. Several years ago, Newsweek had a cover story in which they said of the Gospels in general, these are books that meant to declare religious truths, not historical facts. So, is it possible to separate religious truths from historical facts? There are many who try to divide history and theology as if it can be one or the other but can't be both. And yet, the truth of the matter is that what we have in the scripture are historical stories that actually happen that also teach us about theology. You cannot separate the two. If you do, then it's no longer spiritual or religious truth that has any value. Uh, rather, it must be an honest reporting of what happened in the case of Jesus. This really took place at a given point in history that can be checked up historically, geographically, and archaeologically. I think a lot of events in the Gospels can be shown to be historically authentic recollections of those events. Now certainly, there are going to be events in the Gospels that we cannot prove historically. We don't say it didn't happen, we just say, I can't prove it historically. I think one of the major stumbling blocks for skeptical scholars today is the, the, the whole issue of miracles. If there were no miracles in the Gospels, they wouldn't have any problems with them in terms of being historically reliable sources about Jesus. An interesting voice on this subject is Simon Greenleaf, who lived from 1783 to 1853. He was a prominent professor at Harvard Law School. Simon Greenleaf was a great scholar, an incredibly great scholar. In fact, he is one of the two people who put Harvard Law School on the map. 
So if you're going to attack Simon Greenleaf, you must be willing to say that it's not just the farmer from the South who's out there getting a pig who believes in the Bible, but that there are genuine, real, great scholars who also believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Simon Greenleaf wrote the book on legal evidence. His three-volume textbook, A Treatise on the Law of Evidence, set the standard for decades and was reprinted through 16 editions. Later, he applied these principles to the biblical gospels. There are a few people who have not done their research as carefully as possible, and they will say that Simon Greenleaf was, a, was an atheist before writing this book about the, the, the evidence for the crucifixion and, and the truth of the gospels. That's not true. Simon Greenleaf was at least a nominal Christian, if not a full-blown Christian, before he ever wrote this, and wrote a lot of other things before that, talking about the truth of Christianity. In fact, Greenleaf was an active Episcopalian and once served as the president of the Massachusetts Bible Society. He wrote a groundbreaking book in 1846. It's called The Testimony of the Evangelists, examined by the rules of evidence administered in courts of justice. It evaluates the claims of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our religion then rests on the credit due to these witnesses. Are they worthy of the implicit belief in the matters which they relate? Simon Greenleaf had a variety of criteria that he used to determine the truth of a particular testimony. And here are three of them that may be helpful. One is that ancient documents ought to be trusted unless they prove themselves untrustworthy. Now there are other ancient documents that do prove themselves untrustworthy, but the Bible doesn't. And so we ought to accept it for that. The second is a, a, a rule of evidence that oral testimony cannot overthrow written testimony. So when we find oral testimony of something that goes against what the scripture says, it cannot overthrow written testimony. And the third is a hearsay rule. That is the writer must be writing about either something that he knew or about something that he had done first-hand research about, for example, in the case of Luke. And so when you put those three pieces of criteria together, you begin to realize that the documents are much, much more uh, capable of telling us the truth, much more trustworthy than any other do ancient documents that we have. Greenleaf's book on the evangelists takes a hard look at the gospel writers. Who were they? and what was the emphasis of their testimony. The Gospels belong to the literary style of ancient biography and thus they have uh, re accurate reporting of history as part of their objective. Matthew was one of the original 12 apostles. Um, he was a tax collector. He is addressing it primarily to the Jewish world so they can see that yes, this is the promised Messiah. Tradition tells us that Mark was with Peter when Peter was in Rome towards the end of Peter's life. And because Peter's preaching was so compelling, the people asked that Mark write it down in a systematic way. Luke is concerned. Now, unlike Matthew, who wants to address a Hebrew audience, a Jewish audience, Luke wants to address a Gentile audience. Now, Luke tells us that he made a very uh, careful investigation to give an accurate account of the life and uh, teaching of Jesus Christ. Every last place name that Luke mentions is authentic. Some of the places have been excavated archaeologically. He doesn't make any errors in terms of getting the cities out of line. They're absolutely in line. And then finally we end up with John, the beloved disciple, one of Jesus's inner core, so to speak, who writes his gospel later on um, and probably to supplement the things that were not covered in the first three Gospels that are sometimes called the Synoptic Gospels. John is more interested in the tremendously significant events of Holy Week, what happened between what we call Palm Sunday today and Easter, those, the, the week that changed the world, you might say. 
The Gospels were credible to Greenleaf despite the fact that modernism said, well, these things really didn't happen and these were ignorant people who lived 2,000 years ago and all sorts of things like that. Greenleaf said, let's look at the evidence. Let's do away with this, this sort of prejudice against ageism or prejudice against old books and see whether or not they are really telling you the truth. And in order to do that, he used those rules of evidence, rules of evidence that would have been used at Harvard, rules of evidence that would have been used at any other law school. And he was able, through those rules of evidence, to say, yes, it's true that Jesus did rise from the dead. Greenleaf contested the skeptical notion that the Gospels are wrong until proven right. He asserted that the Gospel writers should be judged by the same standard as are all other writings of antiquity. It is time that this injustice should cease, that the testimony of the evangelist should be admitted to be true until it can be disproved by those who would impugn it, and that the four evangelists should be admitted in corroboration of each other as readily as Josephus, Tacitus, Polybius, and Livy. Simon Greenleaf. Right now we live in a time where the assumption is, is that the Bible as a whole cannot be trusted and the Gospels are particularly put under attack for that. The Gospels are historically reliable biographies of Jesus. They are immensely reliable when you compare their evidence with the evidence we have outside Scripture from the ancient world. We can trust the Gospels and that Jesus rose from the dead. And one of the great pieces of evidence we have, in addition to the Gospels themselves, is this work by Simon Greenleaf, who said, let's take the rules of evidence that everybody agrees on and let's apply them to the Gospels. And when they are applied to the Gospels, then we know that they are true. Skeptics who disbelieve in Jesus Christ have many reasons for doing so, but the evidence is not among them. The Gospel of John tells us, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe him. If the biblical accounts of Jesus Christ are not true, then we are all hopeless and will die in our sins. But if the Gospels tell us the truth about Christ, then we can have everlasting hope. So which is it? Dr. Kennedy answers in his message, Christ and the skeptics. Man being left to himself in a finite world, spinning through an infinite universe between two eternities and seeing nothing about him of real permanency, only change and decay and death, and knowing all too well of his own mortality, has often yearningly peered, trying to see beyond the veil. And yet, there has been no response and no assurance about that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. And so, the hearts of men and minds of men through all the centuries were filled with doubts and uncertainty. No religion had solved the problem, nor had any philosophy. Is there life after death? They asked Socrates while he was on his death couch, and he responded, there may be, but I don't know. I don't know. The Apostle Paul, on the other hand, said, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You can know. And that's one of the great distinctives of Christianity. We can know. We can know what will happen to us when we leave this world. As one great scientist was asked, on his deathbed, did he have any speculations about the future? And he said, speculations, man. I have no speculations. 
I rest upon certainties. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. How many people have I met in my life that have never even read the Bible through, or at best casually, and yet they have concluded that it's full of inaccuracies and contradictions. They know not about what they speak. Well, what does the skeptic, the infidel, the agnostic, the unbeliever have to offer? Is there another book other than the Bible which they attack so vociferously that they would offer to mankind as the panacea for his ills? The one book that everybody must read, the book that is going to answer the deepest questions of the human heart? What is it? They admit they have no such book. No book that three or ten or a dozen could join together and say, this is it. This is the book which is going to meet the deepest needs of the human heart and we will cross the greatest seas and climb the highest mountains and pierce the jungles to bring the knowledge of this marvelous book to everyone. Infidelity has produced no David Livingston's, Hudson Taylors, Adoniram Judsons, who have sacrificed their all to take the only book that's going to satisfy the deepest needs of the human heart. They have no greater book. Do they have a better life to live? I certainly do not think so. You ought to read Dr. Johnson's book entitled The Intellectuals. He takes the eight or ten greatest intellectuals of the past 200 years and describes in detail something you've never read, their personal lives. And it is some kind of reading, the intellectuals by historian Paul Johnson. And you will see these men, that they have no better lives. Bertrand Russell, one of the great so-called philosophers of our time, a great skeptic. According to Johnson, he was a man who was a flagrant adulterer. He seduced the children of his best friends, maids, any woman that he came across. He was without shame. And yet he has the gall to write a book entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. And even says that he has found something wrong with Jesus, morally. Ah, would you like to know what this great moral flaw discovered by one of the great philosophers of the last century said? Here is the flaw. Jesus talked about hell. He knew if there, if there were one, he was going to meet it up close and personal one day. No, they have no better lives to offer. Usually the reason why they are not Christians is because they have never been willing to give the Bible a fair and careful examination. How many times people have been skeptics when they have examined the scriptures and really understood them, they have come to trust in Christ. Well, how about you, my friend? Have you got that confidence, that hope, that certainty that can be yours in Christ? This is what Christ offers to you, peace, Hope, confidence, joy, forgiveness, and life everlasting in the paradise which he has prepared. Has he been born in you? 
Can you say with assurance that he lives in your heart, that he is the master of your life, your greatest joy, the one whom you love utterly, the one who is your God and your King and your Savior? Have you met him? Or are you missing out on the greatest thing that this world could ever know? Ah, dear friend, listen to the good news of the angel. Good tidings, great joy, that can be yours. Even this day, even this hour, if you will but open your heart to him. Dr. Kennedy has just asked the most important question that can be asked. And the answers to these questions come not from a feeling in your heart, but from the facts of history. Without question, knowing Christ brings great joy to our hearts. But his life, death, and resurrection are historical facts. And without those facts, Paul tells us, our faith is useless and our hope is empty. Do you know the facts about Christianity? Can you answer key questions like, is Jesus really the only way? Did Jesus really live? Or was Jesus God? Dr. D. James Kennedy devoted his life to answering important questions like that in powerful and memorable ways. And he shares those answers with you in his classic book, Skeptics Answered. We would like to send it to you as our thanks for your generous donation to help this ministry stand for truth and defend freedom. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. Skeptics Answered is perfect to share with those you want to come to faith in Christ, and it will also bolster your own faith. It's also great for use in a group study at church and Sunday school or on your own. And if you're able to give a generous donation of $50 or more, we will send you Skeptics Answered plus a DVD of the stirring theatrical presentation, C.S. Lewis on Stage, The Most Reluctant Convert starring celebrated actor Max McLean. C.S. Lewis was one of the most brilliant and persuasive Christians of the 20th century through his apologetics works like Mere Christianity and his novels like the classic Chronicles of Narnia. Max McLean brings the great Oxford Don to life in his soaring performance, which the Chicago Sun-Times called bristling provocative, and highly entertaining. Join C.S. Lewis in his journey from hard-boiled skeptic to devout Christian in C.S. Lewis on stage. That's Dr. Kennedy's classic book, Skeptics Answered, as our thanks for your generous gift. And in gratitude for your support of $50 or more, we'll also send you a DVD of the delightful one-man drama, C.S. Lewis on Stage, The Most Reluctant Convert, featuring Max McLean. And as you donate to our ministry, you are helping us reach the world with vital programs like this, proclaiming the gospel, directing lost people to Jesus, and defending the truth claims of God's word. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. It's no secret that we live in a secular age. God is forgotten, and each individual invents meaning and purpose for his or herself. And yet it's clearly not working. Diseases of despair, like drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicidal behavior rose by more than 200% among those under 34 in the previous decade. 
And note well that those are pre-pandemic numbers. It's only gotten worse. The fact is, if this world is all there is, life is indeed ultimately meaningless. We can only fool ourselves for so long. If we are the accidental product of atoms crashing into each other over time with only death in front of us, then nothing really does matter. You will cease to exist and the world will go on without you, at least for a while, until it dies in its inevitable fiery destruction. Now that's a grim picture. And it's tragic that so many have bought into it because it's also a false picture. God does exist, and He has created us for a purpose. But how is it that I can make such a confident pronouncement? It's because Jesus has been raised from the dead. The New Testament accounts of Jesus' life and work have proved true over and over, withstanding the greatest scrutiny. Jesus died on a cross for the sins of all who would place their faith in him. And three days later, he bodily arose and walked out of the tomb, defeating death and proving his divinity. You can find purpose and meaning in Jesus Christ, and only in him can you find everlasting life, which he offers to you as a free gift. Will you receive it? You can do that right now. Begin a new eternal life in Christ by saying this prayer with me from your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sins. I want to turn away from my sins and put my faith in you. Please save me from the punishment my sins deserve and grant to me eternal life alongside you in your resurrection. In your name I pray, amen. Dear friend, if you sincerely prayed that prayer for the first time, we have a vital resource we would like to send you at no cost or obligation to you. It's beginning again, Dr. Kennedy's book for new believers to guide you in your relationship with Christ. Contact us to receive a copy today and may God bless you as you do. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for being with us. And here's a look at the next truths that transform. How many people do you know that aren't saved? How many people do you know and love that, that aren't saved? That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.